this is the framework through which you need to structuralize your research article. For instance, you need to have an introduction, research questions, methodologies, uh, description of your research, and a fixed set of conclusion. If you're violating that, they are uh, your your article is often subjected to rejection because you don't follow those fixed set of parameters. But the, but with respect to my experiences, and and obviously I also need to clarify my positionality, like from where am I speaking, so that everybody knows from what sort of experiences I'm talking about. Uh, and since uh, I am from particularly officially from the background of English literature, for instance, I did my master's in English literature, I did my PhD in the, in the Department of English. And now, uh, with respect to my postdoctoral research, I have made a radical shift towards what is known as not a very well-known discipline of critical diversity literacy. Uh, you, you, you won't find this particular discipline really existing as a kind of school or institution anywhere across the world, except in our uh, university here at the Witwatersrand. So, so, you know, when you make these shifts, you actually get the scope of navigating through different disciplines, different ideas different knowledge systems that actually shape our research ideas, research thoughts, and research activities on a daily basis. And so this is my positionality to clarify. And when I was a student of English literature, always I had to you know, live in that conflictual space where every time the department, the faculties, um, the university structure as a whole would always remind uh, both visibly and invisibly, that these are the certain set of ideas that I can work on uh, when I'm doing my research. And these are the X, Y, Z certain set of ideas, which I really can't work on because they don't affiliate to those fixed parameters of English literature, which always expects from us that we will choose a, a, a poetry text, we will choose a a drama text or a novel or non-fictional text, but something, some text has to be there in the center to do the research. And if you're trying to do a social research, you know, under the banner of the Department of English, immediately, you know, we are kind of marginalized or we are silenced by saying that this is not actually a, a research idea for the English literature parameters, rather it fits more into the sociological paradigm or the anthropological paradigm, et cetera. So these challenges I have navigated throughout and with the passage of time and gaining with gaining more experience as a, as a student, as a researcher, as a lecturer, uh, what I realized is that actually in reality, if we look at the ways in which knowledge is produced in a spontaneous manner, is always very intersectional in nature, obviously about which I would be talking about in due course of my, of, of my lecture. But the question is, if we have to address the issues, we need to find out the right problems, the right challenges that we are encountering in the process. Now, the question is, what are those challenges? And one of the challenges I shared is that every time a research project expects from us that we need to come down to a fixed set of conclusion which is always, you know, we have to conclude our research ideas, our research projects in a very fixated manner, you know, in a very structured manner. Now, why it is problematic? Now, if you understand why it is problematic, you know, we also have to do a form of socio-historical investigation. And it's social-historical investigation you will see it reveals one very important aspect that this very phenomenon, this very attitude, research attitude of mandatory conclusive, we have to, we must come to a fixed set of conclusion, has widely been drawn or inherited from the very colonial Eurocentric parameters of knowledge production. Because if you look at the history of colonization, I mean, obviously you must have been doing it for years through your texts, through theories and philosophies. If you look at the history of colonization, you will always see one thing that they always wanted, you know, to develop knowledge always in a very uh, unquestionable, conclusive manner, that knowledge always should be concluded and should be concluded. Every knowledge, every research idea needs to be concluded and they need to be concluded in a very fixed, 
hierarchical, unquestionable manner. And that is why, and any form of knowledge you will see, uh, which is actually, you know, which is in a disrupted state, which is not very linear, which is not uh, affiliating to certain fixed patterns, uh, which are actually in conclusive in nature, such forms of knowledge systems you will see were never accepted within the very Eurocentric parameters of knowledge pr uh, production. And, and um, you know, the, this is why, you know, uh, for, for example, uh, you know, any form of knowledge that is porous, uh, any form of knowledge uh, that is always in a state of uh, evolutionary state that is in a non-conclusive state has been problematic to these very parameters of the European colonizers. But the question is why? Like why they always had this problem? Why did they, excuse me, why did they never want it to have knowledges which are open-ended? They never acknowledged knowledge spaces which are non-linear, which are non-conclusive, which are always in a state of conversation, which are always in a state of fluidity. Why these perspectives of knowledges were never accepted within the European parameters of knowledge production? Amongst many reasons, uh, one major reason, uh, one problematic aspect, because when you actually acknowledge these you know, these forms of knowledges which are non-linear, which are non-hierarchical, which are always in a state of conversation, which are always in a state of evolution, which are always fluid in nature. You know, the more and more you engage, you indulge in such forms of knowledge systems, what happens is it kinds of always puts the hierarchical knowledges which the Europeans always maintained at stake. So the Europeans always wanted to generate, you know, those umbrellas of knowledges today, which actually exists as in the form of academic disciplines across the educational institutions across the world. You know, they always wanted to discipline knowledge. You know, they always wanted to tame according to their own whims and fancies. And that is what actually gave birth to various disciplines, various compartments of knowledge that we see in the higher educational institutions across the world. Because, you know, disciplining knowledge allowed them to create unquestionable structures of knowledge which you cannot question, which you cannot dismantle, which you cannot challenge, which doesn't allow alternative knowledge spaces to exist, which actually shuts down the indigenous modes of knowledge production as well, those traditional indigenous modes of knowledge production, which have been destroyed across the world to a massive extent with the advent of European colonization. Because they thought such knowledges which are diverse, which are critical, which are engaging, which are subjected to questions, poses a huge challenge to their unquestionable parameters, to their violated projects of production. So they wanted to make sure that this violence of knowledge production, which is unquestionable, which which is uh, you know which is actually dictatorial in nature, remains systematized within the various various social strata, remains systematized within the colonial and then later on the post-colonial social space. That is why at that point of time, what they did is they made sure through developing these academic disciplines and you know these academic disciplines were developed in a very closated knowledge space they were actually had boundaries they were closed and they were never allowed to interact with each other and that is why today you know we see these kind of discourses these kind of narratives are so systematized where when we try to deviate from those fixated parameters of knowledge production that, okay, within an English department, we want to work, we, we want to do a social research or within a sociology department, you know, we want to do a text-based research. Immediately they get questioned and without being challenged, they are accepted because we have been engineered. Our intellect has been engineered by the colonial structures of knowledge production in such a manner that we fail to put forth these kind of questions, which is again, a very important point. Now, this is the point where we need to bring in the question of in-betweenness, 
the question of methodological in-betweennesses. This is the point where, where we need to depart, we need to interrogate and depart from these very challenging, problematic and restrictive compartments of knowledge production. And these are some of the methodologies those have been inherited from the European colonizers that we use consciously and unconsciously on a daily basis to make sure that these closeted hierarchical problematic spaces of knowledge production exists without any challenges. And we fail to do a collective questioning, as I mentioned, because we have been methodologically engineered, we have been methodologically injected in such a problematic way that we really don't understand the necessity of questioning. It's a form of what many scholars talk about intellectual sterilization as well. We have been sterilized, we have been schooled in such a fine-tuned way about these problematic structures of knowledge production, about these problematic compartments, that we really don't find the necessity or the motivation to question these. Now, the point is, what we find when we come to the second aspect, that why do we need to bring in this parameter or the methodological parameter of bringing in betweennesses or the structures of in betweennesses towards this knowledge production? Now, the question is, how do we do that? You know, as I mentioned in the very title of my, uh, you know, reflection, that is the question of in betweenness. Now, how do we do that? Some of the, you know, very important points, some of the very important ways that we can do is, is the of all to disentangle ourselves you know from these binaries to disentangle ourselves from these compartments of research ideas and embrace intersectionality now obviously i'll i'll elaborate on that what do i mean by to disentangle from the question of binaries from the compartments what do i mean by to embrace intersectionality so as i was just arguing about uh, the challenges of inheriting uh, you know, those European parameters of knowledges. I was also mentioning very categorically that how the European knowledge system has always pushed us within those fixed set of compartments. Now, the thing is, if we look at practically, let us keep aside, you know, let us keep aside all these complexities of knowledge disciplines. And let us look at practically the very elements of knowledge production, how knowledge is produced, maybe within our drawing rooms, in the public spaces, in the coffee shops, in the cinema halls, in whichever random, you know, unofficial spaces you can take into instance, you will see that the normal, the usual spontaneous way of knowledge production takes place in an intersectional manner. We don't have to do something special. We don't have to do something different to inherit the quality of intersectionality. It is right there. The, the, the challenge, the, the, the aspect of intersectionality is right there. The only thing, the only problem with us is we fail to, we fail to realize that. Even in your daily conversations, just imagine with respect to the conversations that you had since today morning or maybe over the past seven days, you must be talking about so many things, maybe about fashion, about food, about sports, about houses, about urban life, about crisis, about violence, about, about movies, many, many things you must be talking about in your daily life. Now, the way you talk about, the moment you start talking about, do you do a kind of rehearsal or do you sit with preconceived notions that, okay, throughout the day today only I will talk about these five aspects or throughout the day I will only talk about these 10 to 12 aspects. We don't do that. We sit, we start talking spontaneously and one conversation carries us to another conversation. In this way, we keep on weaving and building conversations. And you will see when you end up your conversation and you do a kind of reflection, you, you will see that you have talked about so many aspects without any predetermined thoughts. So why do we do that? You know, why do we have these kind of, why do we do that? Because this spontaneous way of speaking, that is how we are structured. That is how we are genetically structured, that we speak in a spontaneous manner. But these Eurocentric structured cages of knowledge production actually 
has taught us or has kind of compelled us to break our ideas break our thoughts break our knowledge systems and you know push them into closed doors of disciplines so intersectionality is a very usual way that we converse that we produce knowledge which we need to start thinking as a part of the methodology of betweenness to put it into our research now for instance if i take the example for example if you are working on a particular literary book in your research maybe it's a poem a drama or a form of you know a, a, a fictional work a non fictional work you are working on the text but parallelly also try to understand the 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 sociology of the text try to talk about the history of the text try to look into the anthropology of the text try to look into the other disciplinary and transdisciplinary aspects that feed into your text when you're talking about theories when we are talking about philosophies you will see one thing that we just don't talk about literary theories we don't talk about literary philosophies we draw a lot of references from sociological theories from cultural theories from historical theories and so many important and other aspects of theories so similarly you know when we are working we need to be conscious about the fact that we are talking in an inter we are engaging with respect to our arguments in an intersectional manner where we bring in different disciplines we connect our arguments about the text with various with respect to different forms of disciplines without forcefully restricting ourselves that okay this is the fixed set of english uh, you know a, a, a research work in english literature these are the fixed set of research works in english language so we fix ourselves into that no let's not do that let actually try to connect and interweave from one discourse to another and that is how you know the research work expands and you know uh, there is a very interesting concept uh, i would like to share with you in connection to this what i was sharing about the expansion of research work across various disciplines is a uh, portuguese uh, sociologist uh, his his name is boa ventura de souza santos it's a it's a complex name uh, once my uh, you know presentation is over i'll put the name there in the chat box in case you are interested to look at his works so you know boa ventura de souza santos he's a he's a portuguese so so uh, sociologist a legal scholar a philosopher and he actually uh, talks about this very interesting concept of diatopical hermeneutics you know diatopical d i a t o p i c a l hermeneutics so he talks about this diatopical hermeneutics and a uh, very says that you know diatopical hermeneutics is a is a pedagogical process is a is a way of learning where we all agree with each other that knowledge is always inconclusive in nature knowledge is no form of knowledge can be concluded knowledge is are always in you know inconclusive in nature where you know one form of idea leads to another one form of understanding leads to another so you know if this also could be embraced as a part of in betweenness methodology then the research area simply diversifies you know apart from what we were talking about intersectionality intersectionality also is actually helped or assisted through the process of the embracing non conclusiveness of research you will see nowadays in fact um, in many research articles in many research journals you will see that they like the scholars who writes the articles they don't write a conclusion at the end they often write as continuity even i do that in many research articles where you don't write conclusion you leave your research work you leave your research idea in a state of question mark rather than a statement you leave your research idea in a state of confusion rather than really coming to a very concretized state of conclusion and that is why you know i have titled my a uh, reflection today as confusion as conclusion often it happens you know when we are doing the research while we are progressing we are writing we are doing our field works we are reading we are doing interviews we are engaging and communicating with people we realize 
that you know it is not always possible to come to a fixed set of conclusion our our research idea actually ends up being in a very confused state and this element of confusion should not be rejected this element of confusion should be embraced because you know what happens if we are actually in a state of confusion or our research narrows down into a state of confusion then altogether it opens up a scope for further research it opens up scopes for further conversations because when we are in a state of confusion and leave it there we actually invite people thinkers around us to come into that space and to further engage in those ideas and take the conversation further so you know this intersectionality also pushes us into the state of inconclusiveness let us not think about concluding everything and another challenge you know i should also quickly put that particular aspect here is that why do we always try to draw conclusion because you will see that risk methodologies primarily actually have been kind of inherited from the research methods that exist in the field of general sciences that is why in many spaces in many as i interact with various research students in many spaces especially students in the field of humanities find it very challenging to write the hypothesis in a research proposal and actually which is very challenging there could be a fixed set of hypotheses in a general science research proposal it's not always possible to have a hypothesis in case of a social research in case of even if it is possible in social research it is next to impossible to have it in case of a text based research but still forcefully students are asked that you need to put your this is as a part of your research proposal otherwise that is not accepted that is another problem you know why we always have this nagging tendency of coming to a fixed set of conclusion because mostly the structure of our research has been inherited from those general science spaces and another aspect is you know that we should keep in mind when we are engaging with research is that you know research ideas research developments are always oscillatory in nature you know what is oscillation just think of a pendulum you know it swings from one side to another it goes to the left come to the center then on the right it's consistently swinging it is consistently traveling back and forth sideways okay without stopping so research in general is actually oscillatory in nature and again we need to embrace that thing we are not sitting in a fixated position more and more we are working more you will read and even even you will have this experience i don't know i like those who have done your phd's here uh, there are various faculties who are here in the future many of you would be doing your phd or who are all guys it the point where you begin and as you keep on progressing 6 months 12 months 18 months you know 36 months 24 months 30, 36 months more and more you keep on progressing you will see more and more you get new insights new ideas new dimensions to feed into your research and this experience and again i'm speaking from a personal experience this experience continues till the time of your submission you know even at the time of your submission you realize something is missing you are not very satisfied okay you have put a lot of hard work you have done a great job but somewhere somewhat you feel you you could have said more into it down the 5 years 6 years line when you go back to your research this you reread that you may start thinking that i could have done that in this way i i could have incorporated this set of xyz theoretical ideas i could have incorporated this set of philosophical ideas why does that happen because research any form of knowledge the very methodology of knowledge production is continuity knowledge is exist because there is a continuity of ideas you know if everything ends up in a statement it ends with a full stop you know there then there is no requirement for the continuity of ideas so that is why we have to understand that you know the oscillatory aspect of research is very important we embrace that oscillatory aspect that we are consistently evolving we are not trying to stop let us not come to this conclusion that i have done everything in my research nothing could be done if we have this feeling 
then you must realize that there is something seriously problematic about that. There must be some serious laxity, some serious gaps in your research which you have not yet addressed. If you have this feeling that I have done everything in my research and nothing new could be done because it is never ever possible. And the question now coming to this, uh, you know, very, very third, third aspect of my, of my set of reflections. And, and with that, I'll, I'll conclude and then we can open up for questions and answers. Um, you will see that, you know, why do we need to at all embrace in-betweenness? Obviously, we started with this challenging the very colonial methodologies of research. First of all, realizing them categorically that what are those colonial methodologies that we exist with? The second is obviously challenging those methodologies of research through embracing in-betweenness as a form of methodology. Now the impact. Now some of the impacts, and obviously after an impact, I'll again give a contextual example to justify uh, you know, my arguments. Now the question of impact is obviously when you embrace in-betweenness as a methodology, when you embrace confusion as a way of you know, kind of celebrate and acknowledge confusion, celebrate and acknowledge inconclusivity as a part of your research. What you do is you allow your research work, you allow your ideas to expand across multiple disciplines. And ultimately what happens if after a certain period of time you think of publishing your research work, you know that you have a very wide audience. Your audience is not just often that also affects us a lot that if I write this particular book or particular research paper on this particular idea, then I have an audience from these particular disciplines. You know, uh, when if in the future, if you're writing your book, you know, uh, those of you who have already editing or written a book, you will realize when you fill up the book proposal form, you know, there are like questions, which are which subject areas, which disciplines your book is going to appeal. You know, that is a very critical and tricky question. And that often makes us realize how can we, and our tendency to convince the publishers always remain that our book expands across multiple disciplines. And to expand across multiple disciplines, to, to diversify the reception of our knowledges, of our ideas across multiple disciplines, what is necessary for us is to embrace intersectionality, where maybe officially, I am housed in a particular disciplinary space, that's fine, but you know, it should be built up. We should try to build it up within the scopes and the capacities in such a manner that it also kind of appeals to people from diverse various other, various other disciplinary spaces. Maybe they are not very categorically associated with the field of English literature, but they have the scope of understanding the work. Second thing, Second thing is, when we embrace in-betweenness as a methodology, what happens is it gives us the scope to speak from our contexts. Now, we live in multiple contexts at the same time. Just look at yourself. Just question yourself. You have a specific gender concept. You have a specific uh, you know, cultural context. You have a specific racial context. You have a specific geographical context, linguistic context, culinary context. You keep on adding there. You keep on thinking and you see the least goes on. So we all belong to diverse contexts at the same time, but we all have a respective context. If you see at the very beginning, I shared with you that why, that from which positionality I am conversing with you, from which positionality I'm speaking with you, which knowledge perspective, which knowledge positionality. So in that aspect, you will see one thing, you know, it gives us a scope to speak from our respective contexts. You know, when we choose a topic, when we, when we choose a research idea, when we choose a research paradigm, let us think that why I am choosing this. Who am I? What is my positionality? Why I am choosing this particular research from these set of contexts? What is the relevance it's going to have? It interests me. You know, we need to ask these questions, which we often fail to ask ourselves. We just do it because we think mechanically our the very knowledge system kind of forces us to think in that manner, in that mechanical paradigm, and which prevents us from asking these relevant questions to ourselves. But why do I need to work this particular idea? What is motivating me? What new thoughts and ideas am, am I adding to this? And that could be done when we actually 
uh, disentangle from ourselves from these disciplinary compartments, at least in terms of our research ideas, um, and think from our respective context, which actually also adds to the of positionality as well. You know, that is, what is my position? You know, we need to ask questions to ourselves first before asking questions to a uh, context, before asking questions to texts. We need to ask these questions to ourselves first. And also, to think about engaging in research that actually disrupts the main disciplinary spaces. Now, I'm pre pretty much sure many of you while listening to me must be wondering that how it is practically possible. You know, uh, we have so many challenges. Uh, we, we have to follow the institutional parameters. Uh, we have to follow the, you know, certain uh, departmental parameters. We have to abide by our respective supervisors. There are so many challenges how this is practically possible, um, which is actually quite doable because you see, you know, uh, obviously, I mean, certain spaces cannot be disrupted. Maybe in the future we can dis certain phases, uh, spaces cannot be disrupted. For instance, you know, we have to get affiliated to a particular disciplinary space. For instance, we need to belong to um, the space of a department of English, we need to belong to the space of department of uh, Bengali or sociology or whatever. We need to belong to those individualistic spaces for sure. But the thing is, you know, even within those spaces, through inheriting methodologies like this, like the methodology of in-betweenness, the methodology of confusion, the methodology of oscillation, through which we can actually transform our research ideas and research thoughts through developing, uh, through bringing in these new sets of ideas and kind of challenge the disciplines in a very structural way, in a very consistent way, in a very theoretical and logical way through our research ideas. Um, one particular example, I will share with you one particular context to uh, end up my reflections. Uh, for instance, uh, many of you must be interested in the field of gender uh, and, and sexuality to, to uh, you know, talk about, uh, to, to do your research. It can be a text-based research. It can be a research as well. For instance, you are, you know, doing research works with respect to different communities. Now, you see, if we, for instance, if we are taking the example of the queer communities, it could be uh, the transgender community, it, can, it could be the LGBTQIA plus community people and several others. You see this very identity of being queer is a very in-between state of existence where they very radically, structurally, and consciously they deviate from these binaries of male, female, masculine, feminine, etc. So when we are engaging with the, excuse me, when we are engaging with the work of the queer community, how can we really try to understand them from the main stream dimensions of feministic discourses, those mainstream binarized theories of feministic discourses, when these communities themselves exist in an in-between state where they don't where they radically deviate from this qualification of those binaries, how can we really understand or try to address them from the mainstream theoretical spaces? And this is a question I put in front of you to conclude, as I state that, you know, we need more questions and less statements so that, you know, you start understanding that how we can engage with in between spaces, theoretically, technically and structurally, so that we always don't have to think about, um, always don't have to forcefully come to a fixed set of conclusions. Rather, we can exist in that realm of in-betweenness. Rather, we can exist in that realm of non-conclusivity, where we are generating more questions and less statements. Um, I think I'll stop here. And, and thank you very much, all of you, for listening to me patiently. And uh, please feel free to share your questions, um, you know, queries, agreements, disagreements, whatever you wish to. Thank you so much.
thank you sir for in uh, for highlighting one of the i, I think uh, confusing topics in research uh, methodologies now we are open to question answer session uh, i would like the students to post questions for you students you may ask your questions if there is uh, any sir i think uh, there are some questions on the chat box we can take such questions so uh, should i read the questions for you yes i think that would be helpful okay sir uh, so there is a question from shushmita maji uh, one of our students she asks we generally take knowledge to be something which is true and verifiable now when we are advocating confusion how do we try to approach truth see uh, the the very question of truth when we engage first of all we need and that uh, when we try to look for truth uh, truth is not a a singular concept it's about truths you know it's a it's a plural concept by default it's a plural concept we try to create that paradigm of singularity of truth in order to maintain our power structures in order to maintain our hierarchies and not allow other truths other realities to to surface and play a role so the question is when we are actually embracing confusion as a form of confusion or in betweenness as a form of research methodology what we are basically doing is we are allowing the interplay we are we are acknowledging the interplay of multiple truths now we all speak from our respective now there are obviously scenarios uh, which are uh, where we where the truth and the false and the reality and the virtuality is very clear to us but there are also scenarios where truths and realities are actually based on our respective contexts on our respective existence so obviously this very space of confusion as a as the as the confusion you know this this very space of in betweenness as a form of methodology where we indulge in the aspect of intersectionality where we where we draw our conclusions our reflections on the basis of our positionalities that is where we allow multiple truths multiple ideas to you know interweave with each other so even when we are embracing confusion what we are doing is basically we are deviating from that singular truth model towards the plural truth models thank you sir there is another question from uh, monisha shingo one of our fourth semester students she asked as a student when we answer a question it shows our knowledge of the subject now if our answer is confusing won't that be a discredit to us see the the point is as i said you that there are certain spaces uh, even even at the time of my reflection presentation i was sharing that there are certain spaces you know which is very difficult to dismantle at right away as i say that one is obviously you know affiliating ourselves to a particular department to conduct our research uh, which is very difficult to dismantle right away you know we we just can't do that even if you want to similarly in case of questions now when you're talking about questions i presume let us take the example of you know the way we are doing a semester paper or a particular you are attending a particular semester exam now when you're doing that attendance of a particular semester exam what happens so when i say about confusion as a conclusion it is it doesn't always mean that you end up in a non directional manner confusion as a conclusion is actually when a lot of ideas when a lot of thought processes interplay with each other at the same space that is where confusion arises that is what we are talking about the notion of confusion now here confusion is not the dictionary meaning of confusion that i don't i don't know that so i am unable to produce i don't know what to do 
I'm not talking about the dictionary meaning of confusion. I'm talking about the methodological aspect of confusion, where you have multiple thoughts, multiple ideas interplaying with each other at the same time. Now, this could be possible and may not be possible context of writing, you know, semester examinations. As I say to you, you know, in semester examinations, it desires certain goals, it desires certain parameters, which we always may not be in a state to violate, which actually we can comparatively, we have more liberty to do that in our, like a PhD or MPhil, because there the process of writing, the process of engaging, the process of, you know, putting our thoughts, the onus lies more on us rather than the university system. But in case of an examination paper, unfortunately we are expected to write in a certain pattern so it may be and may not be possible to embrace the aspect of confusion uh, in that space but just to clarify i shared that why did i speak that which from which particular perspective from which particular phenomenon i talk about confusion as a state of confusion not that i don't know anything so i'm not writing anything uh, not that I don't know anything, so I'm, you know, uh, you know, writing something else about that subject. But actually, I know a lot of perspectives. I know a lot of different ways to understand a particular perspective, a particular idea. So that is why, you know, that that is what I argue as the phenomenon of confusion. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's another question from Sreya Bays. She writes, what is the methodology? If Shreya Bez is there, uh, would you please ask your question? She just writes.